Uh, good morning, everybody. This is our own fifth quantum computing tutorial. Uh, this is the last day. Uh, today is we have a uh, presentation, and uh, this tutorial is gonna organized by me, Yuri Alexiev at Argon National Laboratory. So today's presentation is going to be by Danilo Lykov. Uh, he is a graduate student from US Chicago and uh, I had actually many very successful projects with Danilo over years. Um, Danilo will talk about uh, quantum noise, how to deal with quantum noise using error mitigation and error correction techniques. Uh, Danilo, it's all yours. Hi, thanks, Yuri. Okay, let me share the screen. Okay, so um, I have a presentation and uh, a practice notebook uh, on Jupyter. I, I didn't go into a lot of uh, theoretical descriptions since uh, uh, description of quantum noise is, is a very mathematically, I would say, complex thing. Uh, it goes from, from usual state, uh, state vectors formalism to density matrix formalism. And basically in order to introduce all of that, you you have to kind of read a book and and do a lot of uh, a lot of exercises in order to understand how it works. What I will do instead, I will introduce it from more more what I would say a, a practical perspective and 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 give some intuition about where where the noise comes from and uh, what is quantum error correction. So. The, the 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 things that I will describe today would would be probably not enough to you know create your own uh, quantum error corrected circuit, uh, but that would just give you a, a basic understanding of how noise work and uh, what is the the basic principle behind quantum error correction uh, algorithms, and uh, if. If I, you know, if I use something that you that, that you don't understand, please uh, do ask questions. We will have, I think, you mentioned that we will have after one hour we will have like Q and A uh, session. Um, I think even before that, if you just uh, type uh, in the chat that hey, I don't understand this thing, I will just note it, and whenever you know, whenever it's it's a good time to maybe go into details. Uh, over some theoretical concepts, I will, you know, I'll, I'll, I will uh, stop on that because I don't understand what's the background of everybody. I, I, I know that you are, I mean, you, you already uh, was through uh, through the first four days, so you probably are not very new, but but still, it's uh, it's it's very useful, you know, to have the, this this kind of feedback. So uh, that said, uh, let me start with uh, quantum noise. So what is what do we when we talk about quantum noise? What do we what do we actually talk is about uh, the interaction of the system that we are interested in uh, with some kind of outside system. So the the total system you can you can still think of the total universe as a as a single quantum system and describe it using normal uh, state vector formalism. Basically, you. You, you have your Schrodinger equation, your evolution uh, of the state vector, and you can you can just be fine if you are able to describe everything with in, in as a quantum system. But in in reality, you you are only interested uh, in the behavior of a small subsystem of your uh, let's say of your laboratory or the, or the system subsystem. Usually, it is the quantum computer. So. When you think about this uh, small system, it it is actually very challenging to achieve full uh, isolation of this uh, system, and and you actually don't want to achieve full isolation since you you need to somehow uh, you know send signals to this system. If it's a quantum computer, you don't want to, it to be full isolated. So the noise uh, usually comes from the basically the degrees of degrees of freedom that you don't have control over and since you don't have control over, over those degrees of freedom you have to you have to use a formalism that kind of keep keeps track of 
all the possible states of your system. So the, the, the new kind of formalism for tracking that is called the density matrix. And it was originally actually, as far as I know, it was introduced when people were thinking about a gas of molecules and when, when they were, were doing uh, nuclear magnetic resonance experiments. Basically, a gas of molecules consists of a lot of uh, molecules, obviously, and then you don't know for sure that each molecule is in your uh, desired state. So you have to kind of average out over all the different uh, subsystems. Basically, uh, an NMR experiment would think about a gas of, uh, let's say, ammonia molecules uh, as, a, as a single system, but represented as, as, as an ensemble of, of, of multiple systems. So the, the, they would consider uh, a, a system of a single molecule, but in fact, they would have an ensemble of those systems. Uh, and then the, the measurement will, the result will also include the result from a lot of different systems. And then uh, to describe that, again, yeah, we use the density matrix formalism. The density matrix has like three different uh, I would say faces. It, it represents an ensemble of quantum states. It also can be thought of representing a single quantum system, which uh, you don't surely know what, what, what the, uh, a quantum state is. So it's, it's kind of the this, this, this similar uh, of you know, going from the distribution of, a quantum, of, quantum, si uh, of quantum systems to the probabilistic uh, actual, but like this probabilistic notion uh, of, hey, you can have a quantum system in state one or state zero. So the important thing is that we have to distinguish between these classical probabilities and quantum probabilities. So when I say it's, it's an ensemble of quantum states, it's not like uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a usual formalism, you would say uh, state psi equals zero plus one. So zero plus one is, is a quantum uh, superposition of state and, and just zero plus one would be just the state. But if you don't know for sure what is your state in, let's say you, you flip a coin and you know that if the heads uh, flip, then you have the plus state zero plus one. And if the tails, then you have zero minus one. So you, you, you actually don't, uh, you, you can't describe fully you know, this uh, ensemble of quantum states uh, with your usual uh, state vector formalism. And the third is actually it's it's a little bit harder to see that it's the same, but basically the third the third phase is that you you with a density matrix you can represent a part of a quantum system even though if, if this part interacts with the whole environment. And so just a small list of uh, type, different types of errors in quantum computing. There are uh, state preparation errors where you don't know if, if, you, if, you, success, if you have successfully prepared uh, state zero from which you usually start your computation. There was also the gate error and the crosstalk they're very similar, and they also all are described in this uh, density matrix formalism that I will uh, that I will cover later. And there is also the measurement error, uh, which introduces some additional uh, randomness into your measurement. Some it's 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 more like a, a classical error, as in uh, you you can think of it as you, you first measure correctly everything without error, but then you have some some noise that uh, introduces some uh, errors in your uh, in your measurement. Uh, I won't cover state preparation and measurement errors since they are uh, they're usually not very important and they they are not uh, very significant. Uh, for example, the state preparation in most of quantum computers can be done with uh, significantly higher high fidelity. There is significant measurement error in modern quantum computers, but uh, it, is, it, it also can be described as well with, with the formalism of gate error and, uh, 
uh, I will I will just talk about the uh, the usual gate error, which uh, okay. So uh, in order to to describe that, we have to introduce the density matrix formalism. So in the in the usual uh, state vector formalism, we have the state of quantum system represented as a state vector. And then each outcome of, 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 of this uh, of a measurement, if we measure the system uh, in the basis uh, in here, that would be a basis uh, a i. Um, so the outcome would be the, the inner product uh, squared. So we we extend this to to have this density matrix formalism. Uh, it's basically a, a sum over uh, this ket bra. Uh, elements and weighted by different numbers, the probabilities. So the, P, the PI uh, are just uh, the probabilities that you have your, your system in, in, in state psi i. So you can think of it as, 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 a, as a distribution, again, as a distribution over multiple quantum states, multiple pure quantum states. And uh, the outcome from the measurement uh, would be the trace over a uh, product of these two matrices. So, yeah, one thing when I when I when I when I show this cat bra notation, what what does this mean? So, uh, if you if you remember, if you if you have this bra vector uh, uh, or oh, cat cat vector, and this this is a, a column vector. The uh, bra vector, uh, is, it, the bra is actually a co-vector, so it's 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 a row vector. So when you multiply column by row, that would be uh, uh, outer product. And also when you when you apply uh, when you use the uh, conjugate, when you when you move from bra to get, you use the conjugate. So basically, uh, to to kind of you know to 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 show this uh, how how this would be for a pure state if we have uh, state psi uh, and it and it has a uh, components a and b right uh, then the density matrix would be the outer product of this with the conjugate so that would be uh, a times a uh, conjugate b times b conjugate on the diagonals. And then here we would ha have A times B conjugate and then uh, B conjugate times A. So these are just numbers. I can just, uh, uh, I can move them. And, 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 and notice that uh, these two, the anti-diagonal parts, they are uh, conjugate of each other. So this, this shows that the density matrix uh, should, should be, uh, Positive and it should have it should should, should be uh, should have real eigenvalues and in fact you know what the, those eigenvalues are the eigenvalues of the density matrix would be just these uh, probabilities so the this is what uh, what's called also the uh, positive matrix so all your eigenvalues are real and they are also positive because they correspond to probabilities and more more than that since your your uh, probability of having uh, a particular measurement equals to trace over uh, over some uh, probability outcome. If you replace if you if you replace this AI with the sum over the basis, uh, you would come to the conclusion that the 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 trace over of row would be uh, ha has to has to be equal to one because the the sum of the probabilities has to also be equal to one. And uh, another uh, way to write a, met a density matrix. So one way is to write it as a matrix, and then another another way uh, to to write it is uh, as as a summation over uh, multiple terms, and each term represents each particular uh, element in the density matrix, and and. Uh, it's it's rather often that this notation, even though it looks a little bit more verbose, but it, it it's it's very useful, especially when you're dealing with um, multiple qubits. So, 
this is also something to uh, have in mind. You have an option of representing density metrics as this, and this is uh, analogous to uh, to having the state psi represented as a, as a vector, or you can also have it as a times zero plus b times one. Okay, um, clear everything here. Okay, so uh, why do we have errors in our quantum systems? Uh, well, for, for that, you know, to, to, in order to understand this fully, we have to understand what what do we what do we mean when we say that we for example, apply a quantum gate. Quantum gate uh, actually comes from an evolution of, of a quantum system. So we have, we have a, let's say we are, we're, we're considering only a single qubit. And let's say we have the single qubit uh, which evolves under Hamiltonian. And it, I mean, you know, it, it, it evolves always. It's, it's just the nature. So we, we uh, it, it, it always will, uh, change its state based on its Hamiltonian, and also it will sometimes change its state based on, on, on the environment if it's if it's coupled to the environment. If the Hamiltonian describes this coupling, so uh, when we say that we apply a gate, we basically mean that we change a Hamiltonian, we change how this uh, qubit evolves, and then we just wait for for some time. And our hope is that after this time, our qubit uh, arrived to the state that we want to. The thing is that we don't, we we might not have full knowledge about our Hamiltonian under which the system evolves, or we 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 maybe don't have full control over this Hamiltonian. Simple example would be. A uh, precession of a spin in, of of a, of a particle with a, with a spin in a magnetic field. So when you when you have a spin, a sp let's say spin one half particle, and uh, you uh, you put it into magnetic field, it will st it will start uh, what's called precessing. Basically, the this the spin state would uh, evolve around this magnetic field. Uh, and the, the speed of this processing procession uh, would depend uh, on the on the amplitude on, on the strength of this magnetic field. But in fact, this is actually a, a, a real real world issue: is that uh, the the experimentalist tur turned out they had a lot of errors because their lab was close to a subway uh, train, and then. The, the subway train, you know, it uses electricity. It has uh, a large magnetic, uh, and large currents and therefore large magnetic fields. So when a train would arrive, the, their experiments would be very, very noisy and they would basically would not get the results that they uh, expected to. So they had to time their experiments to the schedule of uh, subway trains. This is like an actual real uh, real world example of how something that is outside of your uh, of your control can influence uh, very drastically your experiment. And uh, yeah, so the, the this is like the root cause of of these errors. But there are multiple other reasons for why why we we might have mistakes. That they could be something like from manufacturing errors to errors in your control. In general, the idea is that your system doesn't evolve under the Hamiltonian that you actually intend to. Um, okay. So uh, when you have uh, an operation that you actually want to uh, apply to, to your qubit, Let's say that would be, I don't know, like an X gate. You just want to flip your uh, spin from up to down. Uh, when you apply that, you expect it you know, to, to have some, some result. Instead of that, uh, you might get uh, some error. And you, don't, you, you want to keep track of, 
all of those possibilities. So for that, there is this notion of uh, uh, Krauss operators and the error channels. Uh, the, this is the formalism that uh, instead of applying a, a gate to your state, you apply this noisy channel to a state and what, what, what comes out of it would be the, the modified noisy version of your uh, quantum system. And uh, the formulation of this is that the, this, this noisy channel is defined by uh, a summation over all the multiple uh, components of the noise process. And the, uh, the application of, of these uh, kind of sandwiched, uh, the, the raw is sandwiched between these two operators uh, it's actually one operator, but one with uh, conjugate transpose. Uh, and these are called uh, Krauss operators. They describe uh, different possibilities of what can go wrong uh, in this system. For example, if you have something that is called a dephasing noise, which is uh, there is some probability that uh, you flip your information about uh, the face of the system. And it can be described as a, as a channel where with uh, where you move from uh, rho to one minus p times rho. So that would correspond to having no error. One minus p would be the probability that you don't have an error. And the p would be the probability that you experienced an error and that would be p times z, which is the uh, the phase flip operator, and then rho, and then z again. And then z is here without the dagger because z uh, is is the same as z uh, conjugate transpose, z diagonal matrix. Um, so this is this is rather intuitive representation that you know if your system can with some particular probabilities do this and this and this, you can very easily compose this uh, noise channel. So one, another uh, example uh, is a depolarizing channel where uh, with probability one minus P you have the same uh, density matrix as before. And then with uh, probability P you have a completely, a completely mixed state so that, that a completely mixed state would be would mean a mix of all the possible uh, different uh, quantum states. So that that would be a, the uniform uniform mix of different uh, quantum states. That would that would not contain any information uh, whatsoever. So that's like the worst case scenario. Uh, basically, the, the the pi here is uh, identity. Uh, yeah, so each each type of quantum process uh, has its own error channel, and there is a whole mathematical you know mathematical jungle that you can go into studying how uh, actual uh, error channels affect different uh, states and and how to protect against each of those. Usually, uh, what is considered is the this dephasing and also the bit flip channel, which is uh, instead of x you have uh, instead of z uh, you have x here. So that would be with with some probability you have the x flip. And in 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 fact, if you if you are able to protect against both of these errors, then you're good. You can you can protect against uh, any errors, and uh, basically you have. Full tolerant, full tolerant uh, quantum computing. It's it's really hard to do, but it's it's enough to consider uh, some uh, only some error channels and protect against them, and then combine them in a smart way to protect against uh, all the other errors. Okay, so with that, let me uh, go into the error correction theory. Um, so the, the, the foundation of error correction, of quantum error correction, uh, is actually unsurprisingly in, in classical error correction. 
And the classical error correction says, okay, if, if I want to send uh, some bits of data and I, I, I might have those bits of data, uh, they, they, they might uh, get damaged and some, let's say some bits may flip. And it's, it's, it's easy to think of quantum error correction by using the concepts of uh, classical error correction. Basically, in, uh, in classical error correction, there, there is this simple uh, parity code, which says, uh, OK, I have a, a probability that my bit uh, will flip. So that would correspond to an error channel. Uh, so that would correspond to this noise process where if your bit is 0, it goes to 0 with probability 1 minus p. And then if my bit is 0, it goes to 1 with probability p. And let's say this is a symmetric channel, so it, it works like this. So with probability p, we have a, a bit flip. And then with probability 1 minus p, we have everything's good. So how do I, how do I protect against this error? So one thing that you can do is just, you can say, OK, it, whenever I have 0, let's say I assign a, what's called a code word three zeros. And whenever I have one, let's say I assign another code word, three ones. And then instead of sending the actual information, I send the code word. So I send three times more information. And then uh, since my algorithm knows that the only two allowed possibilities are three zeros and three ones, let's say I send it, right? And then at the output, uh, I have uh, one, zero, zero. So this tells me that I, I definitely had an error in my, uh, in, my error, in, in my channel, in my communication channel. But the thing is that I don't actually know whether that was uh, one, 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 and then I had two flips, or whether that was a zero, Zero, 0, and I had one flip. But in general, it's, it's, it's safe to assume that you know, your, your probability of having just a single flip is p, but the probability of having two flips would be p squared. So that's uh, if your error channel is not very bad, uh, you, you, you better go with the option that uh, just a single bit uh, has flipped. So you, 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 you look at this. Uh, error syndrome, and then you can apply a, a correction. Basically, you flip this uh, bit that you assume that, OK, there was an error, so I, I, I apply a correction. If I have, let's say, 1, 0, 1, then I assume that this uh, bit 0 was flipped, and then I, I, I apply this correction. So this, this is uh, also can be thought of as like a majority vote uh, type of error correction. Uh, so first thing that we have here is that we, we have the encoding of uh, our, our state or our data into code words. That's like the first, uh, the first stage. Then we have our error, uh, the, 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 the channel that introduces our error. And after that, and it's actually not very uh, you know, it's not very. You can't actually notice this in a classical, uh, in a classical counterpart. But we we have to observe the the output. That would be uh, like uh, observing the error syndrome. That's that would be the third step. And then you have to apply the correct the the, the, the correction um, algorithm. So. You, you, you measure the syndrome, and then you apply the correction uh, step of your algorithm. And this is what I have uh, described here on this picture. So the, the, the step one was already somewhere here, and we have the, the data, data qubit. Now, we have the noise that influences the data qubit here. After that, we have the 
syndrome generation, which is uh, basically measuring some qubits that, that, that can uh, give us information about parity. Uh, and then after the syndrome generation and syndrome measurement, so this is also step three, uh, we do a classical part that is responsible for uh, understanding what, uh, given this error syndrome, which is given this, you know, give, given this uh, measured data, what do we have to uh, apply to our to our data qubits to correct for that error? So that would be here we have step four. So note that this thing uh, requires uh, generation. Uh, it requires partial uh, partial measurement in in the in between of your uh, quantum computation. Basically, you, you, you need to have uh, some free ancillas uh, at hand and then uh, perform some similar generation, perform partial measurement, but do not touch the original uh, state. That's something that is actually quite challenging. Uh, I don't think actually there, there is any uh, online platform that allows to do that, even though I think IBM uh, uh, had some announcements that they plan to allow for uh, partial syndrome and uh, partial measurement. Okay, so uh, yeah, the, the, that's kind of the, 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 the general out, outline of this algorithm and we have following concepts here. We have uh, physical and logical qubits. The physical qubits uh, is the qubits that we actually actually use on the device and the logical qubits is this uh, uh, code space. So in, in, in our case, the logical bit would be zero here and one here. So we have a correspondence between the physical representation, in this case, zero, 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 and one, one, one. And then the logical representation is that what our algorithm assigns the meaning to. So this, we, 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 if we see three zeros, we assign the meaning of zero to it in, in our algorithm. So that's uh, that the distinguishment. That that's how we distinguish between physical and logical qubits. Then there is the data and ancilla qubits. So the data qubits are the qubits that have the state uh, in them, that the one that we want to protect. And then ancilla qubits are ones that are used for syndrome, uh, syndrome generation. And then we have our syndromes and our correction steps. The, the syndromes are those uh, measurements that we that we get from uh, from the syndrome uh, generation step. Okay, let me uh, clear. Um, I, don't know, I can't uh, can't seem to find the clear all drawings button here. Okay. Um, okay. So here is an example of uh, an error corrected uh, error correcting scheme. Basically, uh, let's say you have uh, you have a molecule or uh, a, 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 a quantum particle that can that can be in, in various states. And let's say we, we have an angle uh, which represents the state that the particle in. So it's, it's, it could be also like a spin. And uh, we know that it can be in, let's say six different uh, spin positions. Uh, we, can, we can assign uh, the following code space here. So the, the, the state, the logical zero would be the superposition of uh, three here that would be three black uh, black points, so that that would be our zero state. Whenever we see uh, our system in the superposition of these three, we say, okay, that's that's definitely a zero. And then uh, whenever I see uh, the system in superposition of the of the white points, we see we, we say that 
that's our logical one. So note here that I use a system with six quantum states, but I, I only uh, have uh, two logical states. So this, this is also uh, shows this reduction, re redundancy in information where uh, you, you assign, you, you know, you can reuse your larger Hilbert space in order to encode uh, information uh, in your smaller code space. And then uh, note that if you have this arrangement, right, whenever uh, you have a physical process that changes your uh, molecule or your particle, that changes the rotation of, uh, uh, of your system at an angle smaller than this, oops, uh, smaller than this uh, blue, section smaller than this one so whenever the angle is smaller you can you can always correct uh for this error by by measuring the state of the system uh uh by mod modulo pi over six and you can bring it back whenever it it rotates past that you can you, you see that you, when you when you rotate this uh let's say your system was in state zero and then if, you're, if, if the whole particle was rotated by, uh, let's say, pi over three, then you, you, you transitioned from zero to one and you, you, can't, you can't correct that. Okay. So another, uh, so yeah, the, the, remember this, this uh, scheme of uh, um, generating the syndromes and then measuring, so this is very abstract and I have here a much more simpler uh, error correcting. And in fact, this will, we will implement in the, in, the pra in the practical part, this very simple error correcting uh, algorithm. So what, what do we have here? We have here uh, our state phi and this first step uh, is called the encode step where the, the, whenever the state phi is one, it's not whenever, it's like the, 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 the part of the state phi that is one, uh, it also applies a not uh, operation on these uh, data qubits. So after the encoding uh, step, if, if, the, if the original, um, if the original state was a zero uh, plus b one, then after the encoding, that would be a triple zero um, plus b triple one, and this is similar to the classical error correction scheme that I described. And then we have some some noise here. And we assume that this is a, a single, single bit uh, error. After the noise, we can uh, we can detect the parity. So note here that this is very different from the classical uh, part, where in the classical we can just look at our data and clearly see where is the error. Here we have to. We have to come up with something smarter because we don't we don't want to measure uh, our data qubits because they might have entanglement. What we want to do instead is we want to perform a very smart measurement that does not uh, destroy the information that we want to preserve, but it does destroy information about uh, only the state that can be produced after the error. So what, he, what uh, this part here uh, does, so this part is producing the uh, error syndromes. So the error syndromes would be this uh, output of these uh, two qubits, the measurement. And, and what it does here is uh, it applies a C naught from the first qubit and C naught from the second qubit 
And this is a, a, a parity check that these two qubits should, should, should have the same, uh, should, should be the same, basically zero, zero or one, one. And if we measure uh, a one here, that, that would mean that uh, these two qubits are different. We don't know the values, but we know that these two qubits are different. And then we do the same thing, but with the first and the third. So after that, it's, uh, I hope it's, it's, it's clear to see that if we have both zeros here, then this means that this and this qubit are the same and this and this qubit are the same, the first and the third. So this means that there is no error. If we see zero, uh, zero on, the first, uh, on the first measurement outcome and then one on the second measurement outcome, this means that the first and the second are the same, but the first and the third are not the same, which uh, means that the error was introduced on the third qubit. And we can use that information to apply the error correcting uh, step of the, of, the, uh, of the protocol. So in, in, in that case, we would apply the X bit flip gate uh, on the third qubit. And again, for each error syndrome that we measure here, we apply a corresponding error correction uh, gate. So depending on each of these uh, measurements, uh, we would apply X gate in, in different locations. And then after that, uh, we have to decode our uh, decode our, our quantum state from the code space. So we can, for example, use it somewhere else. Somewhere else. And that, uh, uh, that just uses the uh, reverse of the, of the encode part. Okay, so uh, in, the, in, the, in the next last couple of slides, I'll talk about a really interesting uh, practical implementation of that. It might be a little bit uh, too advanced, but I think it's very, it's very useful uh, you know, to see the applications of the theoretical concepts to, to the actual you know, examples. So there is this uh, paper that, that was released rather recently uh, in the University of uh, uh, Delft, I think. And then uh, they, they, they show this quantum device with uh, 17 qubits. And they have the error correcting codes that protect uh, the, these nine data qubits that are in, in the red dots. And then there are uh, eight total uh, error ancilla, ancilla qubits that uh, are used to uh, to encode in the code world, and then they are also used as uh, as the error syndrome measurement code. So you see that each of each of each of these uh, ancilla qubits they have their own um, their their own basis. So they they protect against the x uh, the x flip and the z flip. So the the d Dephasing error and then the, the bit flip error, and uh, the the idea is the same as in, in the previous. So what whenever you see whenever you measure this x x gate and you see that there is no parity error, so there is zero, then this means that there is no error. If you see a one, you know that there has been an x flip somewhere on these qubits, so on one, on one of these. Uh, and the same goes with each, each other. So uh, also by, you know, by coming up with a, with a smart error correcting the correspondence between the error syndrome measurement and the uh, error correcting, you can protect uh, your quantum state. Um, the, the, the trick is that in order to run uh, an error correcting algorithm on your quantum device, you have to run gates. And the gates are the stuff that introduces the error by itself. So it's kind of, you know, you, you, you extend the, the duration of your quantum circuit by doing error correction. 
and it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that by using error correcting algorithms, you you improve your quality of your system because you add more noise by doing more more gates in it. So there 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 should be some threshold value of fidelity of your uh, single qubit and two qubit gates, most importantly, uh, after which uh, the error correcting algorithms are able to correct both you know, the regular error and the er error that is introduced by the error correction itself. And this is, uh, this paper basically, uh, you know, it, it, it is a first step in achieving that threshold. They don't uh, achieve it yet. Yeah, this is the actual superconducting uh, device that they used. Um, I'll, I'll just skip over over these. I'll I'll, I'll show this plot, which is uh, which is relevant to uh, the thing that I mentioned. So when you when you have so on the on this inset, uh, we have the improvement factor x, which is the improvement of the of the fidelity of your uh, single qubit gates. And then on the y-axis, it shows the corresponding uh, improvement in the uh, error. So if your improvement factor is 10, this means that in, in, without any error correction, you have a, a 10 times increase uh, in, or, or actually decrease in the error. That, that's, that makes sense. But what they have shown uh, on, their, uh, on their device so the, the physical implementation is this uh, solid green dot, and then the empty green dots are the simulation. So they show that if they if they improve their qubits ten times, then the corresponding error that they will have would be uh, like an order of magnitude smaller than as if they didn't do any error correction. So they basically were at this point where we we just need to have Better, better gates uh, to to correct for uh, our errors, and then we we have our fault tolerant quantum computing. Um, okay, I don't I don't think I need unless unless we have uh, time left. I don't think I need to to go into details of this particular device. Maybe I I, I mean I can I can talk more about what exactly the, are the error syndromes that they used, but I think uh, this is a good yeah just the, the reference. Uh, I will upload this presentation uh, to the GitHub repo. And yeah, I think this is a good place to uh, ask any questions uh, and just talk about it, maybe you know, prompt for some more detailed uh, discuss discussion. And yeah, after that, we can, we can go for, uh, for, the, for the practical stuff. Dan, there is a question in the, in the chat. Oh, okay. You can definitely unmute, unmute yourself and just uh, ask. Okay. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. So I have a question, yeah, about the example with the trick qubit. Mm -hmm. And my question is, if we're trying to check the priority of uh, qubit 2 and qubit 3 with the first qubit in order to be able to see if there's an error, then wouldn't we also we have to check if the priority of qubit two and three is the same, and then determine if there was an error in the first qubit? Oh yeah, that's that's actually a, a good a good question. This uh, so we are only we are only interested in uh, the phase flip here. So we don't we don't correct here for the uh, oh so sorry we are only interested in bit flip. We don't correct for the phase flip. So there, there still might be an, a phase flip, uh, which would, uh, you know, which would, which would make an error in the in our uh, probability amplitudes. So uh, regarding the uh, the flip in the first qubit, if you have uh, two ones here, if you measure it one and one, this means that one and and zero. Oh, sorry. Uh, first qubit and the second qubit are not the same, and the first qubit and the third qubit is also not the same. So this means that the qubits two and three are the same, and this also means that you have the error on the on the first qubit. So the, this the, uh, you don't actually need additional uh, third pair of C naughts 
to measure that. The, the code space of two possible errors covers it all. Because you have four, four total possibilities. You have no error, and then bit flip on, 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 on first qubit, bit flip on the second qubit, and bit flip on the third qubit. And that's your four uh, corresponding values of this two-bit two register. I see. OK, thank you. And you heard the presentation. It was very informative. I wanted to ask uh, was how error correction algorithms, uh, like uh, uh, say error correcting codes, are applicable in quantum? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, the, the audio quality is very bad. Uh, error correcting codes, like cyclic error correcting codes, linear codes are applicable in quantum. Yeah, yeah. So th there, there are a lot of different error correcting codes. Uh, it's, it's a whole, uh, you know, it's a whole large uh, branch of quantum uh, information science. Uh, there are. Uh, I think what 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 you said there is like basically the question was how are the different error correcting codes applicable to the to the quantum science and I guess what you're interested in is like what are the the best error correcting codes is that right? Uh, yes, uh, that uh, that was my question. Okay, uh, so yeah, so the the. Uh, the, the best that is right now uh, considered is what's called uh, surface code, uh, which is uh, the simplified version of this code is what they have in this uh, in this work. Basically, it it is built to uh, the to to accommodate for this uh, surface structure, the, the layout of the qubits on the on the grid. But there are a lot of different uh, other error correction codes. Some of them they have uh, proof of uh, you know proof of stability that the, the, they, they have proven that you will get you know perfect uh, error errorless computation once you are able to implement those codes. Some of them protect only uh, against some set of errors. And I think you mentioned also the cyclic codes. I, I, I'm not sure, but I think this is what uh, they have here. Basically, you have this, you know, this uh, cycle structure where you can uh, can rotate all the uh, all the states, and then you know you, you get in your your other code words. So uh, I don't I don't I don't have you know I don't have a lot more uh, to say uh, about other uh, error correcting codes. There are a lot of them and like going into describing each one of them would, would be a lot, uh, probably more than, more than we need for this, uh, tutorial. Uh, thank you a lot. Uh, thank you a lot. Yeah. Uh, so Sergey, go ahead. All right. So, um, if I understand correctly, based on the, um, this is example you show with a uh, circuit uh, where you have sort of data qubits and uh, sort of error correcting qubits. Uh, so there is some type of balance, right? Between the, uh, how many error correcting qubits you want to introduce uh, and well, because they, they will correct more, I guess, but at the same time, they themselves have prone to the errors, right? So you don't want too many of them, presumably. Um, so I was wondering if there is some type of estimate on um, optimal size of the circuit, including this error correcting qubits uh, based on, let's say, decoherence time of individual qubits. So, so in other words, like how, how, many, uh, how many error correcting qubits you can introduce really in given side circuits if you have certain decoherence time, de de decoherence time for, for those qubits. So. I see. Yeah. So uh, I don't have, you know, a, gen a general answer to that, since that would require, you know, a lot of simulations for a particular uh, noise model that you have. Yes, uh, sure. Yeah. So, but in general, I would say that that's like, you know, a ballpark estimate is that you have to you have to have a fidelity 
uh, of your two qubit gate around 99%. Uh, mm -hmm. Only after that threshold, you you have uh, you know your your error correcting algorithm doesn't add as much noise as your you know or, or original uh, gate sequence. So this is something that I you know, talked about a little bit in 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 the end, where this, this you know this uh, trade off between uh, between the errors uh, in the in the, in the in the in the device and actually you know errors from from the quantum error correcting scheme. So you see that at improvement factor 10, that would be like tenfold better than. So this is the, the, the fact that they have uh, not like perfect fidelity, that the error is not zero is because their error correcting scheme does not protect from uh, from uh, error processes, like two, two bit error processes. So if you, if you introduce additional, uh, so you, you have to introduce uh, basically in order to, in order to correct uh, all types of errors, I think the the ultimate goal would that it, that was proposed that I've heard of is having uh, having nine uh, nine qubits in the square grid, basically three by three, and only single logical qubits. So basically, having eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that would be my concern. So, th is there uh, is there any hope to expand that to the sort of something I don't know, like a dozen qubits at least, so something like that. I mean, that, yeah, that's a good question. And, and and also like how how good at this scale, like how good would be your your quantum case? That 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 definitely does add some skepticism uh, to error correcting compute. But but that the the proposal of nine you know, eight and similar qubits, that's for a perfect fault tolerant, uh, super, super quantum computation. That's not uh, like, that's probably not achievable, you know, in, in a very near future. But what, what I've been demonstrated is that, I mean, it's, it wasn't, it hasn't been really demonstrated. The improvement of error correcting hasn't been really demonstrated yet, but we can achieve like uh, an order of magnitude of improvement with it. and. Uh, yeah, if, if you see that, so improvement factor ten would be, you know, a good good point. And if we see at the uh, errors here, they have some gates that have five point four percent two qubit error. So we we have to go down uh, quite a lot. So so probably so ninety nine percent is you know it's an absolute must. But what actually this paper shows is probably that would be ninety nine point nine percent. Uh, and after that, you, you can have some benefits from from at least at least partial error correction. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, maybe I can also attempt to answer that. Uh, Dan, can you show this three qubit? Uh, yes, yeah, that one. Yeah, so uh, you can see you have you have here ancel qubits, right? Ancel qubits. We need to make measurements. So whole scheme relies on the idea that you can actually make its measurements. Uh, you, you can entangle, make your measurements, and actually re-entangle, right, after that. Because you constantly actually want to make these uh, measurements, right, on these um, ancillo qubits. But the problem is that it's actually quite slow right now, is, is actual result of these qubits. So this scheme does not actually tell you actually how long it takes after you make the measurement on ancillo qubits, how long in how many actually seconds or uh, in how, in how much time actually it will it will take for these qubits to be ready again uh, for for the next actually for the next single measurement, and uh, this is a kind of like it's one of the reasons why there are issues with that, and obviously you want to actually make your measurements and your correction before your original uh, qubit right it decoheres as well, so that's now a limitation of this. On the top of that. This one does not also, you remember that measurement itself introduces a error as well. So that's actually yet another limitation of the scheme. And there is no actually very easy way how you can correct that, at least in the surface code formalism as, as it's presented. Yeah. And, and also it's not very easy to measure part of the system because for example, in, in, in trapped uh, neutral atoms, uh, what you do is you shine a light, a resonant light, and you just take a picture. Uh, 
in order to do that on on a, on a on a part of the system, you would have to somehow separate that. So you would have to, you know, you would have to do the entanglement, then move part of your system to some place where you don't, you know, your your laser light would not touch your original system. So that also very is very challenging. Mm -hmm. So 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 basically, I think what uh, thanks Yuri for the for the comment. I think I. Yeah, I didn't realize the time is also an issue here, but I guess, I guess the, uh, the, the message here is uh, one would need the, uh, still needs a qubit with certain uh, minimum, I guess, decoherence time, right? Before even uh, any type of error correction scheme can be considered because otherwise, uh, I mean, where is, I mean, if the decoherence time is too short, so then the introducing of any type of correction scheme actually, might make things even worse in, in principle, right? So, um. yeah, and, and, and uh, I would say moreover, uh, there is there are uh, multiple papers actually on simulating noisy uh, uh, quantum circuits. Let me try to uh, find it real quick. Okay, so I think this is, yeah, this is the one. So in this paper, they, uh, they efficiently simulate noisy 1D quantum circuit. And what they show is that if you have a noisy two, two qubit gate, depending on the, uh, on the noise probability in this, uh, in this two qubit gate, your entanglement in your quantum system uh, does not sustain. Like so, this uh, on this plot, figure three here, the y-axis is the entanglement uh, between the between the parts of the system. It's like maximum entanglement between two qubits. Like, I will not go into details, like how do the how do you calculate that entanglement? But basically, that's like a measure of how those qubits are connected. So you see when the error is zero, it, it saturates and it, it's fine. It just stays there. But if you if you have your error finite, let's say if the error is, I don't know, like 0 0.04, then it saturates and then it goes down, which is you know intuitively what happens when you apply a lot of uh, a lot of layers of uh, uh, of the gates. But the interesting thing is that the maximum point also goes down with uh, additional error. So the thing is that it's not only the error, it's not only the number of qubits, it's also the error that limits the simulation of such systems. If, if, you're, if you're able to, uh, you know, if, 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 if your two qubit uh, gate error is 0 0.10, you can simulate arbitrary number uh, of qubits. It's not, you know, it, it has to be. That's that's I guess why IBM has this notion of, of quantum volume. You have to optimize both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, William. Uh, do you have a question? Oh, I, I was going to ask something similar to what was just asked: uh, the number of ancillary qubits that would be needed. So that that kind of answer. Thank you. All right, uh, any other questions? Yeah, I think I might have a question if that's okay. But this is more, I guess it's more, not very specific, but more, more general. So, you know, it's it's interesting that we're using, so in, in most of these error correction schemes, we use um, entanglement to protect Qubits, but it's you know it's the same. It's sort of the, the the same. Yeah, it's the same entanglement that causes information to be lost with, you know, entanglement of our system with the environmental degrees of freedom. And I was just wondering if you think that we can, you know, if, if it can be some sort of that we can see error as some sort of asset of gaining information uh, as well because of the entanglement with environmental degrees of freedom. But it's just something I thought about, but I don't know if it's 
if it's um, something that so so you you're saying what if we can use uh what if we can use the so like you're, you're saying okay, so you're saying error as a tool basically use error as a tool to to do what so to you know gain information about you know it's 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 also getting entangled with uh you know for example i'm thinking what if there's something that is causing error in our system so we're working with a quantum computer we're working with qubits and we get these errors mm -hmm. can this well i'm thinking can can we use it as some sort of you know quantum sensing device you you know like quantum computers are as quantum sensors i don't know this yeah sort of thought but, of i mean that. it's it's actually the other way around we use quantum sensors as quantum computers what most of the research that was done in quantum computing, it actually comes from quantum sensing. And the, the, the example that I showed here, where you have, you, know, you have your lab underground, right? You uh -huh. have your uh, nu nuclear magnetic resonance, or you have even you know, like your squid qubit, and you have it in your cryostat, it's, you know, it's in Faraday cage or whatever, but still, uh, when, whenever this train comes, you know, I like 100 meters out above you. I don't know what, what's the actual, but like let's say 100 meters above you. Uh -huh. uh, you can feel that, yes. So the, the, this is basically the errors are the, the, the measurements that you don't want to make <laughs> because they measure stuff that you don't have control over. So you can, you can but yeah, it's, it's, the errors are basically because qubits are also a very, very uh, very sensitive sensors of magnetic field in particular right. and all the other stuff. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I just thought, you know, I just said maybe using, uh, detecting, you know, some sort of other type of types of radiation, maybe, you know, um, you know, yeah, I, yeah, but thank you, yes. Yeah, I mean, probably you can, you can, you can use that, so, yeah, I would say that th those quantum systems, you can probably come up with a quantum system for anything that you want to measure very, very sensitively, like, you, you know, electric magnetic field, uh, radiation, photons as well. Uh, the, the tricky part is that usually when, when it comes to quantum computing, you don't actually want to want to want those interactions because they interfere with with what you are doing. But in principle, yes, you, you can definitely use a qubit as a sensor. Right, okay, thank you. All right, yeah, so thank you for questions, but uh, let's go to the next step. Uh, Dan, do you want to take a short break or just go straight? Uh, no, yeah, definitely let's take a short break because uh, I think it would be nice if everybody had, or at least everybody who wants, uh, to run it, uh, you know, just then download the uh, the notebook uh, and either run it in IBM uh, cloud or on your machine if you have installed uh, Qiskit. Basically, the only uh, Qiskit and Qiskit and Qt that these are. Uh, uh, did, did you upload your presentation into? Um, yeah. Uh, GitHub. Yes. Yes. So let me show right here. You go to this repository and it's just this notebook. Okay, so please go ahead and download it, um, upload it in your favorable uh, Jupyter notebook <laughs> environment uh, where you want to execute it. And uh, so how many minutes do you want to take break? No. Let's uh, let's see. Maybe like if you if you are able to download and and run the first uh, the first two cells, just uh, type a, a plus in the chat, and we'll see if, if we have like I don't know five ten pluses. We can start. All right, but let's maybe make uh, a five minute break. Yes, yeah, so. and yeah, and no more than five minutes. No. Okay, 11. so let's come back at 11, uh, 15 a.m. Central Time. Mm
is not defined. Okay. All right, uh, are we back? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, maybe let's start, uh, uh, but then can you maybe uh, zoom in? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's good, yeah, thanks. So how many people were able to download it? I think three people at least uh, from the chat. Yeah, I think it's four, five now. Six. Yeah, I think it's more than enough for you to, to begin. Okay, yeah, no problem. Uh, all right, so uh, I will use NumPy as, as a main. So basically the, the simulation, the, 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 the code here has two parts. Um, I had somewhere, uh, Okay, never mind. Um, yeah, I, uh, the, the, there are two parts. So the, the simulation of error and then the emulation of um, error correcting uh, algorithm that I have here. So let's start with the first part. I use NumPy as a main, you know, it's like a custom, sim very simple simulation engine. <laughs> Uh, and then Qtip uh, I use for vi just for vi visualization. So uh, start with just defining the, the Pauli matrices and uh, defining this uh, channel class. Like I uh, I like this to define this uh, using the uh, object oriented programming since um, we have this channel and we have different kinds of channels. So this is a very natural uh, usage for uh, OOP. And then I can define this uh, call method, which is, um, I don't know, for, for, for those of you not very familiar with Python, if I, if I have any object uh, that is like a function or a class and I have this syntax internally, so, and I pass something here, uh, A, B, C. So this internally translates uh, to 
an equivalent, yeah, of course, A is not defined. So it's internally translates to this A, B, C. So that's uh, you know a feature of Python that, that, that how it uh, works uh, under the hood. And basically this allows me to define a channel and then use it as a function on uh, a state. So uh, again, I don't know if, if what is the familiarity of everyone with Python, but this thing after the colon is the type annotation. It just says, what is the type of the input? And in, in my case, I want uh, the input to be the density matrix to apply uh, uh, my error channel to the density matrix and this. Uh, so we have this input of type numpy array and I also want the number of dimension to be two. Uh, and yeah, this is pretty simple. This is what, what we have in the uh, definition of, of the cross operators. It's just uh, application of multiple uh, cross operators to the density matrix. And I, I use just a, this, dummy function to calculate each term. So basically, this, so yeah, this uh, add sign means the matrix multiplication. This is what NumPy uh, you know, overrides this operator uh, internally. So this is effectively uh, the operator times the density matrix times the operator uh, conjugate transpose. And I apply this to row. So I pass row to this function here e and h rate over the self ops. So the self ops is a list of NumPy arrays and it, it denotes the uh, each contribution of the cross operators here. I don't have the, uh, the uh, p here. So the, the p is kind of the probability of having an error is kind of encoded into these operators. So sometimes Sometimes people show it with the, the probabilities. I don't have the probabilities as, as a weighting here, but it's it's encoded in the uh, operator in the in the actual uh, in this uh, element of this self ops. And uh, using this abstract channel, I can <clears throat> I can define the, for example, the dephasing channel, which is square root of one minus p times identity, the first, uh, the first kind of outcome of your uh, channel. And then the square root of p times power least two. And that would be the z. That would be the third element of this array. That would be just the, the, the z. So that, that would correspond to uh, this error channel. And the square root I have is because uh, I have here a and then a dagger. And if I multiply them, the, the prefactor would just go be before that. So I have to have p here in order to conserve the, uh, the so the, in order for the density matrix to be a valid density matrix with a unit trace, have to have the probabilities to sum to one and also the probabilities have to you know be, be actual probabilities. So that's why I have square root because of uh, because I have two matrices here. Um, and yeah, so and uh, the thing that I do here is I initialize the defacing channel, not with, so the original initialization method is taking the list of uh, the cross operators. Uh, instead of that, I, I uh, in the defacing channel, I override this method with uh, having a P probability of having an error and then I call the method of the superclass to initialize it with this. Uh, so this may be a little bit unusual call, you know, changing the signature of the uh, constructor method. Um, I don't have any problem with that. Maybe this, you know, if, if you want to uh, have a, the same oper operation applying to the channel, to the abstract channel and to the phasing channel, then maybe it's not a very good approach since you would need to, to do custom code to Take care of uh, different channel types, but as long as as long as they use them, you know, in, in a simple environment, I think that that should be fine. Uh, so basically, yeah, this super dot init calls the super method of this, and it passes the operators. 
to um, to the to the init to the constructor of the superclass. And there is also a gate channel. So one thing that is nice about these channels is that they they don't only they, they, they can not only describe error channels, they can all also uh, describe just as fine an application of a noiseless gate. So uh, remember when I when I when I have this introduction of the density matrix and we have the psi i uh, cat times psi i bra. If I apply, let's say I apply a unit uh, a unitary to to my psi. Um, what would that so I can just replace this with let's say phi and what would be a density matrix for that that would be just phi phi but that can also be replaced as u times psi it's pretty easy to see that uh, this kind of sandwich uh, is equivalent to application just of, of a single unitary to your original so and 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 this is the same the thing that we have uh in our uh error channels the same kind of construct so if i just have a single element single cross operator uh that would just be a fine application of evolution without any noise and if you if you have noise you have this kind of uh bipartite uh, behavior where you have uh, the identity, application of identity with some probability and application of uh, some error gate with some uh, another probability. Um, yeah, so that's that's like the setup of our noisy simulation. And then uh, this function is a helper to generate a unitary um, the that it basically is a custom single qubit gate with uh, three parameters. It, the first two parameters determine the, the vector of rotation on the block sphere, and the second parameter, or the third uh, parameter, is the angle of rotation around that uh, around that vector. And I, I just use this for demonstration purposes. Okay, so the, just the first example is that we we generate this uh, small x rod, which is just a number numpy array, and we we can create this gate channel, which I create created here, um, with this rotation. So this this would just uh, create an, an operation, like an operator to our raw state that would that would change our raw state to represent a pure pure vector, but and another pure vector uh, rotated ar around uh, corresponding with this unitary. Um, and also here I have just the conversion from the uh, the state vector to the density matrix, uh, and this is this I just used to define. So let, let's say we have a, a pure state uh, of a system that is in state uh, zero. And that would be a corresponding density matrix. Um, so let's just apply our rotation to the example row state. And you can play around, of course, with, with the different rotation angles. So for example, this, this Powell unitary, this means that uh, np.py is the, the uh, what called azimuth or latitude. Uh, uh, angle so the np pi over two would, would mean that we are on the equator and then the zero is mean means that we actually are on the in the x direction and this is the angle so we this is a rotation around the x-axis so that that's basically a x x phase gate and we can if we rotate um if we rotate np dot pi uh we should have here, uh, a density matrix that represents the zero state. That's oh, actually, it's it's two times that. So we 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 arrived to the same spot. If I take np.py over two, 
I should have, yeah, so it can be seen easier if, if I run. So you see that after I applied this uh, rotation, it's no longer small, but uh, yeah, the, the, you you have you, you you've rotated your your state uh, to the to the uh, south pole of the block sphere to the one. This is what you have for for the. And also an interesting thing is that uh, we can see how would the y state look like, and it looks like this. So. Um, uh, this is uh, like a fully entangled uh, state. And you, you see that when you have uh, entanglement, uh, you have those anti-diagonal, uh, anti when you have a superposition, sorry, when you have those anti-diagonal elements in the density matrix. Okay, um, so let's then, this is, I mean, this is fine, but it's not very demonstrative. So I use here uh, these se several uh, functions uh, helpers for visualization. So this is our state that we rotated around x-axis of uh, over pi over four. Uh, well, actually it's rotated over pi over two, but the parameter here is pi over four. Uh, so this, you, you can see that this indeed corresponds to our y state. And if, if I change that to, uh, pi over two, you can see that this is also fine. So let's change it back to the small value. Um, so yeah, I won't go into detail what these functions are doing, but the, the very tricky part, just, you know, if you, if you ever use uh, Qtip uh, after, it's a very handy tool for uh, simulating the evolution of quantum systems, not in terms of like quantum computing, but in actual quantum systems with Hamiltonians and everything. The tricky part is that uh, you, you have to create a new 3D axis. Then this is like, this, this cost me like two hours uh, debugging uh, some, some time earlier to find how to, how do, how do you use your custom axis to plot the block sphere on? So you have to create this new 3D axis uh, with this parameter just you know, just maybe that would be useful uh, just in case. And uh, yeah, the block sphere I can plot with vectors and with points. So if, if I provide here uh, vector equals false, that would be just a point. Um, uh, that's also a nice thing that we have that they have in QTIP. Okay, so let's start with visualizing the an evolution of a qubit. Uh, so this is a kind of small code, but it, there is actually a lot going on. Uh, maybe let's split it in two. So it's a little bit easier to digest. So we first start with so the, the, the idea of this evolution is that we take our initial state and then we apply a sequence of small rotations. So the small rotation takes from zero to this vector here. And then we apply a sequence of those small rotations. And then that would just demonstrate us like an evolution of our qubit. That would actually demonstrate the, uh, you know, the, 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 what actually happens with the state when you apply the X gate is that you apply this evolution and then you stop after, uh, after it, if after it gets to a particular point, and then you by tweaking that time of a gate, that that's what you would do if you do like a pulse level uh, gate. Uh, so the, the, the but by timing that rotation, you would you can control where to stop. Uh, so and each of these steps would be just a small rotation. So I would have a variable that describes the number of steps and the I want to rotate by np dot pi, but not not fully. So I have you know just for visual, it's it's not a full uh, full rotation. So I have the d phi defined as a small step of angle, and then also have this uh, small rotation again. The 
the NP array that corresponds to Pauli unitary, and then the channel object uh, that corresponds to the gate channel. And I also initialize the initial uh, initialize the initial uh, state row from to be just the zero state. That's just the preparation. And then, okay, here I, I create two more uh, preparation object. I create a new 3D axis uh, and I create a block sphere. Okay, and then I visualize the first uh, the first uh, state, the initial state. And then, so in this loop, we actually do the evolution. We, we iterate over, in this case, 30 steps and then apply. So each next row would be a rotation over the previous row. And then at each step, uh, I, I call this visual, visualization and I use just the, the dot option. That would, and then after that, I, I call sphere.render. This is what we have. This is basically the evolution of our uh, state vector. Oh, not yeah. Basically, at this point, this is a state vector. This the, the density matrix uh, formalism is redundant. It just describes a pure vector without any noise. Uh, okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's now look at um, at the error channels. Uh, so yeah, depolarizing the name here is not uh, is not very correct. So polarizing is usually this channel, but I use it depolarizing as in like bit bit flip uh, channel. So the dephasing corresponds to uh, the zz error, and then depolarizing in in this notebook corresponds to uh, the xx error. Uh, and you can see that, uh, just check what are the operation, let's say, in dephasing channel. So th this parameter is the probability of having an error. And, and you can see that the uh, operators in the in our dephasing, they they look, um, I'm sorry, there was actually a click here. Let me remove this. So you, you uh, can see that there, there, there are two different operators that correspond each for each error uh, channel. And we can apply this to our uh, row example. So, um, okay, hold on, why is it the same? Ah, yeah, it's the same because dephasing doesn't change, um, doesn't change the uh, state. If it's, if it's, if it has no phase, there is no, you know, there is no error to, to deface. So let me uh, call this depol and then apply the depolarization channel to our raw example. You can see that our new state vector, uh, I'm sorry, new density matrix has uh, has now changed and it it, it has 0.98 that's in a diagonal uh, for that would correspond to the first uh, to the state zero and then 0 0.02 would, would correspond to the state one. Uh, may, I, I think I didn't talk about that, but these are actual probabilities of having zero and one. If we don't have uh, diagonal elements, these are these the, the diagonal elements in the density matrix would be your actual elements, and it's easy to see if you if you think about uh, the density matrix in um, in this formalism where here. So um, if these are all zeros, your density matrix is just uh, row zero 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 plus row one 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 one. So that would clearly mean that uh, the your density matrix is is a composition of two states zero and one, and each of these are just the probabilities that come uh, from from this equation. Okay, and so again, let's let's uh, let's in this case let's evolve around a different a different axis. So I will I will pick um, I will pick another uh, an, another initial state and oh yeah uh, I will I will uh, rotate around the x-axis still the x-axis by but uh, but different initial state this will be just a little bit more handy to visualize so it's 
the state that is more close to one uh, than to zero, and you can see that it's 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 also the same kind of rotation that, that that we that we that we have seen earlier. And okay, let's so now let's do the fun part, which is uh, actually applying the noise. So you can see that uh, so this this first part is that uh, the is the the dephasing noise, and then. Uh, okay, the, so this this rotation. Let me uh, actually change the we, so we have better understanding what's going on here. The 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 rotations between these were a little bit different, so I'll have to change. So so this this is the actual noiseless rotation. Sorry about that. So this is the actual noiseless rotation. It's a rotation around the z axis. And it's it's a rotation uh, at, the, at the bottom of this block sphere, and when we apply the dephasing noise, uh, you can see that it kind of goes to the center, to the middle of it. So how do how do I apply this dephasing noise? Is I again I create this uh, rotation, the gate channel, but with a different Pauli unitary. This in this case, the rotation axis is just the vertical axis, uh, and so I have this different initial state. And when I do the evolution, here the most important part is I, I first apply my rotation and then I apply my error channel. And uh, the result of this is that the, the, the dephasing part kind of shifts my state to the vertical axis of the block sphere. So let's you know, you you you're you're fully free to play around with different different parameters. For example, we can uh, we can see what happens if uh, we reduce the probability of error. Let's say we instead of doing zero point three, we do zero point zero one. We see that it it so the, for comparison, the top part is the noiseless, and the bottom part here. Uh, is the noisy. So you see that it's uh, it's becomes less pronounced. So it's not not as bad of uh, as an er of an error. But let's let's say we we make more than one rotation. So it, it kind of it, it goes as a spiral uh, to the to the center. And you know more more points. Let's make it Forty points. So you see that it, it goes as a spiral to the it kind of spirals to the to the center of, uh, not to the center of the block sphere, but to the vertical. And this is a, a very interesting property of the dephasing noise. It doesn't change the projection of your um, of your quantum state on the vertical axis. It only changes phase. It, it, it only adds uncertainty about your phase. But this is a purely, I would say, purely quantum noise because uh, it doesn't change like a classical information about your qubit. The probability is still zero or one. But if your uh, classical, uh, if your quantum computer has lots of dephasing noise, it becomes a classical computer. Basically, the, your your uh, state vector becomes just a classical uh, probabilistic computing machine, uh, basically machine. So, yeah, this is just adding more so you see that's a kind of exponential decay to to the center okay and then uh this is an example of uh, depolarizing noise uh no oh, yeah actually it's it's good that i have the same variables here so when i change it here i use the previous variables of d phi and small rotations so you can see that the depolarizing noise which is the vertical flip Actually, uh, does the, the 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 convergence to the center? So it's 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 more of a kind of more of a destructive noise, uh, if if you want. And you see that it, it has a little bit of different effect on our uh, on our quantum computing. And then, you know, if if you if if you want in your free time, you can always add. Uh, another another channel by by just having this copy then you can you can have something like uh, uh, very bad channel 
and that 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 that's that's what I would use for for this what is actually a depolarizing channel. So, and then here I would I would just have um. Let me see. You would have to have a summation. You would have to have uh, a summation of all the powers. I think so. That would be one over uh, square root p over three, p over three, and then. Oops. So that would be uh, my very bad channel. That would add basically an identity. So this this would be the sum, the sum of this. Uh, it's like a, a super general general error channel. The probability of one third, you have all all the three different types of errors. You can also check check out how how it works on our block sphere. Um, so it's 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 pretty interesting, right? So it's it 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 it, it looks like it's more it's more fast than. Uh, than the the x uh, x flip channel should should have rena renamed it. Uh, but you see that this one has a couple of um, okay. Yeah, the, the the problem is that I have to reinitialize it. So this one does converge to the center, but it does it a little bit slower. This one, uh, it looks like it converges much, uh, much faster, at least from uh, from what we see in, in this picture. And of course, you, you'd have to, you know, you'd have to have a more uh, rigorous analysis. In general, so this, uh, okay, oh, okay. So probably the, the there was an error somewhere in, in between these. So this this is the actual the actual uh, the, the very bad channel uh what we had so yeah you see that it's it looks like it's a little bit uh faster converging to the center than uh, the depolarizing channel okay so yeah this uh this is a really nice uh tool to analyze the impact of noise also i want to say uh one more thing about uh, how how we look at the density metrics so Remember when I when I said that we we have we, we can analyze the density metrics as a, a, a probabilistic or like a weighted sum of different states. Mm. So now this, this actually extends to performing this uh, 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 summation of the vectors on the block sphere. Imagine if you have a fully mixed state, a uniform superposition of all the possible quantum states of a single qubit. So that would be all the points on the on the surface of the block sphere. If you make just if you take the average, which would correspond to the uniform superposition of those, you would end up in this center. So the center point corresponds to the uniform super, superposition of all the quantum states. On the other hand, if you imagine that uh, you know your your noise adds additional flipped uh, vector to the uh, to your block sphere, and then you perform a summation. You see that if if you if you think of if you look at this uh, all the states on this uh, circle that have same uh, zero and one probabilities, but they have different phases. So if you sum them over, you would have this state uh, inside of the block sphere. Uh, that corresponds to a, a superposition, uniform superposition of all the pure quantum states that lie on this circle in the block sphere. Okay, uh, I think we have 10 minutes uh, left for the uh, error correcting. Uh, that's totally fine. The error correcting example is, I guess, as small as you, as you can get it. Um, so if you have any questions, it's a good place to ask them. Let me check the chat. Okay, it looks like everything's fine. Um, all right, so, oh, one, 
this is just the one thing that we can reconstruct from the expectation values of the x, y, and z. We can reconstruct the density matrix, and that would be one half of one plus the expectation of x times. So basically, the density matrix can be created from the Pauli operators directly, and that correspond to the, the same state um, as, as the one that merit. So RHH would be the same as R rho here, but it would be it would have different numbers, but it would internally correspond to the same quantum state. Okay, so let's go to the error correction. Let's implement this thing. And the 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 circuit is, I don't know, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but I'll still go over it uh, anyways, um, just to make sure that that uh, there is no no you know, no assumptions here. So we have the uh, initialization state. I just have this angle zero point seven as an arbitrary angle, which which you would just rotate uh, your uh, x, uh, and then and then I have this encoding part. Uh, which corresponds to these two, two C nodes. So this part here is the application of noise and we can change this just to try out <clears throat> to apply various gates. And then um, after we apply the noise, we apply the, um, the error correcting. Uh, so this, 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 this would be, oops, this would be our, oops, this would be our, measurement of the symptoms. And yeah, one thing that, that is a little bit tricky about uh, how I do this in Qiskit, I have to define a separate uh, classical register to store the output uh, data. This is because uh, I want to use this classical register in the classical if. So this is something that uh, not a lot of uh, quantum simulators can do. You can encode a classical if in your uh, circuit. So let me plot, plot, let me plot the circuit. That would be our circuit, maybe. I, uh, okay, maybe circuit. Well, something like this. Oh, okay. Doesn't use a multiple chip. So yeah, you can see, so this is the initialization, then I have two synods, then the noise, then two controlled, and then uh, can, uh, controlled nodes to our ancilla qubits, and then the measurements. So, and this is the classical application of, uh, of the X operator conditional on different error syndromes. So the way I, I, I came up with these one and three is, I just looked at uh, what are the different error syndromes that we can have. So if the if the error syndrome is one, or the bits are zero one, that would correspond to zero and one, and the, then this means that uh, the the first two qubits are fine, and then the uh, the one is the error. So, but the the tricky part is that uh, Kiskit uses the uh, I think big end end notation so that would the zero one would actually correspond to one zero so that would be three uh, or, or or two so that corresponds to this so I, I would have to correct the last the last uh, qubit if I see one zero uh, if I see zero one uh, I know it's it's a little bit confusing when when you think I don't know why Kiskit has big end annotation, but if you if you work out through the all the different options, that's 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 what you uh, come up with. So and pretty easily, if if you have one one, that's just three in the classical register, and that would correspond to having an error on uh, the second. Um, Okay, and then after all of this, we can uh, we can perform some measurements. And here I have the H operator uh, as, a, as a measurement is my as my measurement operator. And uh, you can see that 
Okay, first, first we we might need to simulate this without any uh, any noise. That that's our noiseless outputs. So this uh, here is an explanation of these labels. So the first five uh, are the qubit uh, outcomes, and the, the the last three are the classical register outcomes. We don't have any errors here. Everything is good, and the, uh, the, 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 the these last two zeros are our, our error syndromes, uh, our, our ancilla qubits, and the two zeros means that we don't have any any errors. So the probability, the the, the last again, this is the big and little endian uh, conventions, but the last bit here is actually the first qubit. The, the the zero could be with the label zero here and the, so the probability of getting it the one is like one like 15 percent and the probability of getting zero is like 85 percent just from judging from the uh from the, from the picture and then if we apply the age we see that there is a probability that and so we apply the age on zero on the first qubit and that would correspond Kind of to have a uh, uh, quantum uncertainty on uh, on our on our first qubit, we can also apply the x flip. Let's look at the h. So we we still have the the possibility that we don't have any out any errors. This is what we have here, and this is uh, also uh, what what we have here. And then we all, we also have a possibility. Uh, so these are the our three ones is the code word for one and three zeros is the code word for uh, zero. But we also have the possibility that we have a single flip and that would correspond uh, to a single flip here and also uh, a single flip here. Not sure why here it doesn't, it doesn't display this. Ah, yeah, because we, we, and you see that if we didn't correct for this error that uh, we would have a single flip on our first qubit, but uh, but we did correct uh, against it. So we we corrected this that bit flip, even though our syndrome is one. We still have the the the, the code word as three zeros. So this is after after the correction. Maybe it's it's useful to uh, to show what what it looks like when we don't have correction. So let me remove that. Uh, and you see that everything is the same, but this bit was flipped and it's not correct so that's that's why we have this uh, error syndrome measurement and this uh output okay so but this is not very useful since we need to you know we need to look at the statistics over uh the actual measurements of our state this is this just shows all the possible outcomes what we're interested in is actually the the first qubit which is uh qubit here e, or the, the, the fifth qubit in this uh, string. And we are looking at, we are interested in the, the total aggregate statistics over different uh, system outcomes. So we're, not, we're not interested in the full system outcome. Let's say we, we're only measuring the, uh, the last qubit. So that, that you can, you can uh, do that with just, uh, we just uh, basically post-processing uh, the shots, or if you were to run an actual quantum device, you would actually measure uh, only a single qubit. Okay, so last step is just to actually verify that our uh, error correcting works. I I have here I just put this um, this whole quantum circuit to a function that it, that has a parameter the error angle. And basically, I have an error on the first qubit, which is just the uh, the first uh, the the x rotation uh, using the some custom angle. And I want to test that it actually works on different angles. So I, I run this experiment for various angles and and used oops, didn't run it and and I, and and I update are like aggregate count statistics and after that i can i can just plot the statistics for 
uh, the aggregate. So this is the, the uh, average or not average the aggregate statistics over four experiments or actually five experiments with different angles. If you see it's it's uh, it's quite well correcting. So this is of course it, it simulates uh, the shots. So you have some uh, output uh, just output noise because you estimate the uh, output uh, state, but the state is actually the the error corrected state, the valid state, and you can also try adding uh, adding as a second error so basically having two uh, bit flips so and, and our error correcting code should fail now because it only it was designed only to correct for a single bit flip. and you can see that clearly we have a statistic that doesn't correspond to uh, what 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 was the theoretical uh, statistics value for our experiment um, okay that's it Any questions, comments, etc. Don't see any questions, comments. Um, we are almost out of time as well. Uh, can you maybe type your email address in case if people have questions? Okay. Yeah. Send a message. Sure. Let me type that in chat. All right. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, all right. So, uh, thank you for the presentation, Daniel. It's uh, it was great, um, and uh, thank you all the speakers uh, for the presentation. Also, I want to thank uh, you, Katie, and uh, John to help me uh, organize this. And um, so we are done for this year, but. Next year, we're going to have uh, this tutorial again. The difference is going to be that hopefully uh, that we'll have uh, quantum optical experiments added to this tutorial as well, which would be actually great to actually to have actual physical, um, like you say, demonstrations of these actual quantum effects. All right, uh, but uh, all these presentations are recorded. And uh, we are going to edit them and uh, clear them for Argon. And after it, we'll post them on Argon's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, it will take uh, a few weeks.